Hello, I'm Helena Chance from Bucks New University and I'm here to introduce you to our wonderful volunteers who are working on the Woodlanders Lives and Landscapes project. Woodlanders, as we call it, is delivered in partnership by Bucks New University and the Children's Conservation Board and it's one of the 18 projects that come within the marvellous Chalk Cherries and Chairs Landscape Partnership Scheme. Chalk Cherries and Chairs, which is supported by the National Heritage Lottery Fund, is encouraging people to get involved in documenting the heritage, conserving the wildlife and the landscape of this beautiful and fascinating region. Our volunteers working on Woodlanders are investigating the lives of men, women and children who made their livings in vill villages and woods in trades such as chair making, lace making, straw plaiting and tambour beading which was the art of sewing beads and sequins onto textiles for the fashion industry. Our volunteers are busy not only researching online and in archives, but also they are interviewing people who remember their parents, grandparents or great-grandparents who lived and worked in the central Chilterns. First of all, we're going to meet Leslie Hoskins, who's research associate for the project. Leslie's starting off in Great Hampden and then she's going to Bradenham Village where are some of our volunteers are meeting to chat and have tea. So, well, we've come to Great Hampden because this is one of the important spots for one of the trades that the Woodlanders Project is interested in, and that's bodging. And what bodgers did was that they converted raw trees into beautifully turned and rolled and ribbed chair legs and stretchers for the uh, chair industry of High Wycombe. As you can see, probably, around here, there are an awful lot of woods. And this was mostly beech woods. And Great Hampden was a particular spot of interest because each year here, there was an auction, a huge auction in the autumn. And they were divided up, parcels of woodland were sold off to the bodgers so that they could make them into chair legs. So the bodgers would come, they'd get their auction catalogues and they'd walk around the woods looking at the wood that was for sale, at the timber that was for sale. And it was a good day out and it was a particularly good day out because there was free beer in the Hamden Arms. This is where the auction took place. After the bodgers had bought their timber, the trees were cut down. Then after a year was up, then the bodgers would start working it. And some of them, they built, they worked it where the trees fell. They built little huts in the woods, working in the woods, and they'd travel from their cottages by foot or bicycle. It was a long, a long hard day. Other people actually preferred to work at their cottages, and so they'd bring the timber back to a workshop, a little workshop that they might have in the yard or attached. Bodgers continued working in this way ooh, up until about the Second World War. And in fact, the last two Bodgers, the Dean brothers, worked in these woods right up until the 1950s. So there, there are quite a lot of people living around here who either knew Bodgers or remember the Bodgers and knew how Bodgers worked. And indeed, there are some people who are descendants of Bodgers. So we've arrived now in Bradenham with our group of lovely volunteers. And we're going to just chat a bit about what they've been doing on the project, on the Woodlanders project. We we'll start off with Rosemary. Rosemary lives in Lacey Green, she's lived there for many, many years, and she's a huge expert on lace making in the 19th century, 20th century as well. And um, yeah, she advises the people who are looking into lace making, and she also knows an awful lot about lace making in the middle of the 19th century. Yes, I hope I know a bit about lace making. In the 1851 census, there were 83 lace makers out of a total population of 307. Most of the lace makers were over 12 years of age and two were over 60. The youngest was seven. In Loosley Row, which is also part of our parish, the population was 281 and there were 50 lace makers. So in Lacey Green, half of the female population were earning a living making lace. It was a cottage industry and so they worked obviously from home preferably outside where the light was better. Uh, they would work with a group of friends if they could, sitting outside their front doors. And even if it was cold, they still worked outside. They had a thing called a dicky pot, which was like a little chamber pot that they filled with embers from the fire. And then they put it under their skirts to keep them warm. Must have been a bit dangerous. And I'm told that they smelt appalling. <laughs> so if they did have to work indoors, 
they managed to work and use one candle as much as possible. So several of them would gather around one candle. They would have a glass flask filled with water, uh, which would magnify the light for them. But it was much more difficult indoors. There were lots of children and elderly relatives. Ten people living in a two-bedroom cottage wasn't uncommon. Susan has, has been looking into lace as well, but looking into it more, I think, from the lace dealing side of things. So yeah. people made lace, but, you know, who did they make it for? How did they sell it? The lace was sold largely to lace dealers. Lace dealers, well, a typical one was Thomas Gilbert of High Wycombe. He reported in 1862 that he'd got 3,000 lace makers working for him. What uh, it was a system by which the lace makers themselves uh, didn't make a lot of money. And it, as Rosalie said, it was very hard for the uh, children particularly. What brought it to an end was three things. First of all, there was always competition from machine-made lace, uh, largely often from Europe, that was much, much cheaper. The lace dealers tried to counteract this by making more interesting patterns, changing the fashions a lot, uh, which obviously they could do if they were um, uh, not doing it by machine. But second, the other thing that really affected were two edu two acts. There was the um, Education Act of 1870, which provided free compulsory elementary education for children up to the age of 13. And also the Workshops Act, which set out minimum requirements for the hours worked and conditions. I think it was probably largely the economic issue that uh, the drop in the prices that yeah stopped it working. They did move into fancy beadwork often uh, after that, but I think again the profits were very low. Thomas Gilbert was only one of the dealers, there were others, but he was the largest one I think around here. Also, I think Peter's been finding out, he's been looking at the, at the workhouse at Saunderton, not far from here, and uh, looking at the census to see who was in the workhouse. Were there a lot of lace makers in there? Some years there were up to 34. What I've discovered is when you're looking at the workhouse, you're actually having to do economically the negative of what's going on outside. Because while the economy is booming, you're expecting less people in the workhouse. When we're in a depression, then you're expecting more. In this particular area, which is surrounded by bodgers and chair makers, especially in West Wickham. One expects that the women sat at home were probably lace makers. Uh, when you think that you're really going to get the information which would come to 1901 and 1911, the information dries up. 1901 is appallingly recorded, um, but it still worked to be done um, on why people were in the workhouse, why there were so many young women in the workhouse. Um, in 1851, of the uh, 34 lace makers, 18 of them were below the age of 30. I haven't yet had a chance to cross-check whether they were unmarried mothers, of which there were incredible large numbers that obviously got sent here, out of the way. It's a long way from Wickham. Nobody knew where they were, and nobody could see what was going on. Um, and then the children were taken away at the, end, at the age of four, where they went to the Union School in Bledlow. And there are, there are some real anom anomalies in the inhabitants of the workhouse. The one that fascinates me, and I want to find out more, in the 1851, there's a retired schoolmistress. Now, how does she finish up in the workhouse as an inmate? Um, what we don't know is, um, and it's you say, is how many of them actually suffered from Alzheimer's or age-related mental illness and things like that but it's work in progress. So there was lace making which was you know getting harder and harder for women to make any any money at uh, as time went on. Um, I think there were some other industries as well we know that there was um, somebody's mentioned already that there was beading and we don't know a lot about beading as yet, but uh, we think that Homer Green, a lot of it tambour beading in the in the 1920s and so on, was done in, ta in, in Ho Homer Green. It was quite a big centre. But we're looking for volunteers actually to look into that. I think it's a fascinating kind of 
you know, somewhat unknown area. But I think that there was also another um, another area where people could work was in straw plaiting. And I think Vanessa, who's been looking at um, Buckland and Buckland Common, uh, knows, has been looking at the census and also looking at an interview with an old straw platter. And I think she knows quite a bit about that. That's right, Leslie. Um, the, the village that I'm researching, straw plaiting was definitely the main industry, the main cottage industry. There was a little bit of law of lace making in the 1851 census. There were six women recorded as lace makers, but by 1871 there were only two lace makers in the village and by 1891 there were none at all. So it, it had virtually died out in Buckland and Buckland Common. But the main cottage industry, straw plaiting, was very big. In 51 and 71 there were um, around about 200 straw platters in the village. So, yeah, I know, and that, that was 25 to 30 percent of the total population, mostly women and children, but there were also straw dealers. And um, you mentioned the recording, the old history recording, which is in the British Library. Um, her name was Nellie Keane, and she was interviewed in 1957. And um, she remembered as a child doing the straw plaiting and she said that her mother used to take the completed plait to the market in Tring. But if people didn't go to the market themselves, there were nine straw dealers in the village and they could get them to, to take their plait for them. But um, sadly, the, the straw plait industry did die out as well. As, as lace making did. By 1891, there were only 41 working at it by then. And then by 1911, it had disappeared altogether. There were no straw platters at all. And that was down to cheap imports from the Far East. In the 1911 census, there were very few women who were given an occupation at all. Uh, we can see that there are differences between different villages like Lacey Green and Buckland and so on and and Keith's been looking at where we are now you've been looking at the census a bit about Bradnam I think I wonder if you could tell us about what the, what they did in in Bradnam. Bradnam was actually a very attractive little parish uh, and it is quite small there's only about 150 people in the 19th century and you'd think that actually there was a fairly simple answer to that question well there isn't. <laughs> um, more people were probably working on farming than anything else, but the numbers diminished from a peak of about 30 plus in 1850 down to about 12 by 1911. So that's been a steady decline. And if you look around today, it's still a largely agricultural parish, but very few people actually working in farming. The second industry in the parish was not surprisingly furniture making, mainly towards the woodland up there. But equally that dim diminished. The peak seems to have been quite early here in the um, 1850s, 1860s, and that was diminishing um, by the time you got into the end of the 19th, early 20th century. And what seems to have taken the place of those in this parish was domestic service, very largely. Now, not surprising because over the back here there's a big manor house, okay. um, but the numbers there were steadily increasing both paid servants and unpaid. Up by unpaid, I'm thinking of typically unmarried daughters who today we would probably call carers, but they were down as housekeepers or something like that. Um, and by the time you get into the 20th century, 1911, there were more people who were domestic service than furniture making and farming combined. It's a small parish but it actually has quite an interesting history in terms of occupation. So that's, I think that's quite interesting. It sounds a bit different from other places that we've been looking at, from Lacey Green and so on. How about Winchmore Hill? Jane has been looking at Winchmore Hill and she's been investigating particular families and particular places and particular businesses and found all sorts of interesting things. What would you say is the most interesting thing that you found out of Winchmore Hill? Um, when we look at Winchmore Hill around the turn of the century, we find actually that chair making is one of the biggest industries there. And at that time, out of the 99 men who were employed in the village, 
46 of them worked in the chair making industry and that was actually the largest employer. These are going to be mainly in family run little businesses. So there were about four of them at the time employing a small number of people. And one of the interesting things about them is that they, the owners of those businesses, all their children married each other. So there were lots of interrelationships between the different families who were involved in chair making. And uh, whilst the men ch tended to do the um, more the making of the chairs, the women were more involved in caning. So they often made the chair seats for them. So there'd be a link there with the platting really as well. Um, one of the families I've been looking at is the Percy family. And George Percy uh, moved to Winchmore Hill in 1870 when he became the landlord of the plough. And it was he who set up probably the first chair making workshop in the village, which was behind his pub, which was obviously very successful because his two sons also went into chair making. And one of his sons set up another chair making factory in the village just down the hill. And then these two married into a further chair making fa um, family who lived just down the road and his daughters married another one who came down from Manchester. So it was all very interconnected. Um, the Percy family actually stayed as landlords at the pub for 90 years. So it went from George to his son, to his son's wife, and then to their son, and then on to another son-in-law. So it was in the family for an awful long time, although the chair making aspect of it didn't survive all that time. Um, one of the other families I looked at was a, a bloke called Arthur Hext and he was a sole trader which was quite unusual. He set his business up after the First World War and just he had a workshop and he lived behind it in a, in a little bungalow. And I'd be really lucky enough to interview his daughter who's still alive and living in Homer Green. She's in her 90s now and she had lots of memories about growing up in Winchmore Hill in the 1930s. And at their house, they didn't have any running water. Um, they had to get it from a well in the garden, well into the 1940s. And they had a, a toilet that had a cesspit, which Arthur had to clear out once a year. And they used what they cleared out from the cesspit to put on their vegetable patch, because they grew all their own vegetables. Um, and Arthur's wife, Elsie, as well as making chair seats, she also had a bicycle and used to ride off to Beaconsfield and do service in the big houses there. So it was quite a sort of little industry and they worked very, very hard. What really struck me about talking to uh, Joan, his daughter, was how very small the lives were that everything was in their local community. So they shopped there, they worked there, they lived there, they didn't seem to go on holiday very much and they worked really long hours. And it, it reminded me a bit like this period of lockdown where we're much more reliant on our neighbours and our local shops than perhaps being able to go out further. And that certainly seems to be something that characterised right up until the 1950s really in a village like Winchmore Hill. So it's, it's been quite inter interesting research. And Jane's actually working on, on, on a walking tour of Winchmore Hill, which will be ready to go live next year, lockdown permitting. So thank you very much for all explaining what you've, been, what you've been working on. I just wondered if you'd just like to be able to say really, really quickly what it's been like working on the Woodlanders project for all of you. I found it very satisfying and rewarding and the best thing of all is that actually some younger people are taking an interest in local history. I thought it was going to die with me. <laughs> so I found it very, satis uh, very satisfying to know more about what their lives would have been like and it's something to tell my grandchildren how hard <laughs> it would have been. I think the thing that fascinates me more than anything else really is how much of the history is hidden. And concealed on purpose it's very difficult to find out any information on the workhouse mm. it's very difficult to find out information on this building behind us which was owned by which was bought by Ernest Cook the grandson of Thomas Cook and the secrecy of this is mm. something that fascinates me because I want to get in and find out and, and let people know it. 
Um, well, I just really enjoy looking at census returns. To me, they really bring history alive. You know, you can, you can see a snapshot. It's just a snapshot every 10 years, but you, you know, you can find out so much about people. I think if I were going to sum it up in one word for me, it would be revealing ways. So it's, it's, it's revealing the facts for me that I found interesting. I've enjoyed looking at the family aspect of it and trying to understand how families live their lives in what isn't that long ago and it, it really is quite different. So I mean I was just reading last night about how scarlet fever was still in Winchmore Hill in 1907 and that's something you don't really think about very often but you know we have come a long way since then in terms of how we live our lives. Well, thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much for all the work you're doing. Thank you very much for coming out this afternoon, where it's getting a little bit chilly now. But now we're just going to go off and have a nice cup of tea and maybe a cake in the Red Lion just down the road. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for all the brilliant work you're doing for Woodlanders. Our volunteers are also preparing more walking tours and public talks and a Bodgers pub tour to include drinks and lunch. Find out more about these events on the Chalk, Cherries and Chairs website and sign up to receive the newsletter. You can also read about the progress of Woodlanders research on our webpage, where you'll find lots of information including blogs by volunteers and our quarterly newsletters. Could you be one of our next volunteers, discovering more about life in the Chilterns long ago? Do you have memories or photos of past family members who worked in some of the village industries we are investigating? If so, get in touch with me by phone or email. Here are the contact details.